So welcome to the Photographer Academy and another live talk photography with this time the amazing Francisco Estevez, excited photographer Mark Cleghorn is here. Uh, and, and I say that because, you know, I'm a real big nut of dance photography and things really. And when I asked Laura uh, any chance to get Francisco on for me and he said yes, <laughs> it was uh, there's an advert over here in the UK, which is a, a celebration of oranges and it's the man from Del Monte. He said yes it's a big advert in uk it doesn't mean anything to you I, i'm sorry but i was a very excited mark Legon. so well welcome how are, how are you today uh i'm doing well thank you mark thank you for having me um i always like to um say yes to anything that i can uh that's photography related and i like to share um the, the things that we do in our studio um you know, I'm, I'm always an open book, so I, I like to view myself in that way. So uh, when this photo when this opportunity came about, I, I, of course, wanted to be a part of it. And I, I, I looked at the channel and I thought it was really interesting what you uh, you are doing. And i um, just really excited to have a chat and um, answer any questions. So doing well. Thank you very much. So um, before we get into the eight images for anybody new to talk photography, we only do eight images because um, we try and keep it to the hour. And because we're photographers, we talk about photography. Uh, and if we had more than eight, image, eight images, it would take more than the hour. So that's the reason, in case you were wondering why we limit um, our, our photographers to actually talk, talk about anything really. Uh, before we get into the eight images, uh, Francisco, um, can you let us into your world, kind of, how did you get into photography? You know, what kind of you been doing? You know, how does it all work for you so far? Sure. Um, so my my, uh, my photography career started in tandem with my uh, professional ballet career. So um, I started dancing um, at the age of around six. Um, I'm originally from Quito, Ecuador, but my family moved to the United States in 1995. I um, I started training uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, which is where my family. Um, started uh, their US journey. And uh, from there, I progressed over to the School of American Ballet in New York. I danced with Boston Ballet for a few years. I've danced uh, in Spain um, for a couple of years before settling in Denver, Colorado with the Colorado Ballet. And I had the majority of my dance career here in Colorado. I was a principal dancer there for almost 10 years now. And I left the company um, uh, not too long ago in 2021. Um, right around the same time as the pandemic hit, everything shut down for us in the dance world. So it was a really great time to focus on my my photography career, my dance photography career. And um, when I was in Spain, um, I actually got into dance photography because there was a lot of dance photographers in the company. And we would constantly be touring around the, the world and, the, and, and Spain and, um, I saw them, you know, taking photos from the wings uh, of the stage, taking photos from the auditorium when they weren't cast to be performing. And I'd always had a love of photography. And it was kind of uh, when I saw these people doing it, I was like, oh, well, I love dance and I love dance photography. Why don't I try and put them both together in, in some more formal way? And so I bought my first, you know, DSLR, very entry level camera and started playing around. Um, and then when my, my wife and I moved to Denver, Colorado, uh, I had a thirst for more gear, uh, but needed the money to buy that. So I, you know, decided to figure out a way to turn the the passions that I had in dance and photography, and and see how I could make that happen uh, in more of an entrepreneurial setting uh, that could allow me to expand uh, my creativity, but at the same time also work with different dancers in the community. And um, I slowly started branching out into sort of the volume aspect of things, doing recital photos. Uh, school photos, uh, audition photos for dancers, and um, I did that very much part time. Uh, in 2017, 2018, I had I rented my first little studio. Uh, before that, I was doing everything out of the Colorado Ballet uh, studios, the dance studios. So I would, you know, have some time booked in there, and I'd come in with all my gear set up, do a big shoot, and then leave. Um, and uh, eventually I, I found that if I invested in a studio, I could be a little bit more productive with the, the type of quality images that I wanted to produce. And um, ever since 2018, I've kind of moved around a little bit and finally settled in the studio that we're currently in, which is actually just two blocks away from Colorado Ballet. So I'm not too far away from my old work. Um, but it, it was really great timing, the pandemic, um, although it was hard in the first few months, you know, when we started opening back up, uh, dancers still weren't able to go back fully. So we had a lot of 
um, clientele that was ready and available to come in and work with us. We did a lot of creative sessions with dancers. Um, we expanded the different types of photo shoots that we offer in our studio and were able to diversify um, the activity that we did in a way that really supported um, some of the creative sessions that we wanted to do more personally and um, fund, fund them in that way that was sustainable. So um, I'd say the turning point for, for us in becoming like a very established business, we have three photographers now on staff and a social media manager as well. So 2020 was really a, gave us the ability to do that because I wasn't able to dance anymore. So I focused full time on this. And by the time it was ready, uh, I was ready to go back to dance. Uh, there were many factors, one of them being uh, the, the success of the photography studio that kind of pulled me back in this direction and I ended up leaving, leaving my, um, my dance career. Very good. So do you find yourself torn at times because you're looking at the imperfection of the dancer in front of you when, they, when you're asking them or you're trying to actually get a specific kind of move? Or do you allow yourself that little bit of, no, this is a dancer, you know, they, they can do, you know, they do what they do. I'm not trying to make them into little me or whatever it would be. How does that, because it must be very hard as a photographer and as a dancer to kind of look mm. at images in a different way to a photographer who shoots dance. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I think part of what we really developed uh, within my style and I, what we like to do in our studio within the team is have a really uh, good understanding and intricate understanding and philosophy behind posing. Uh, because even if you have a dance background like myself and the other photographers on our team, yeah, posing for, for photography in dance is different than dancing. It uh, poses for dance if you're in a live theater or in rehearsal or on um, in, a, in a classroom setting with, with dancers. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, tricking the camera into representing three-dimensional images on two-dimensional planes and playing with angles and figuring out what a pose looks like authentically in 3D and how do we change that to make sure that it's represented well in 2D is, is a lot of what we deal with when dancers come in. So, um, you know, we, we, we work with younger dancers up to professional dancers and uh, obviously the professional dancers have come and worked with us before. They know a little bit more about what looks good on them. They've done a lot more shoots with, with us or without us independently. So they have more experience and that experience will always make things easier. But even with our younger dancers, we try and make sure that we play to their strengths, um, use our posing techniques to, to help them look their best. Um, and by the end of that, by marrying those two things together, we really uh, are able to create something that I'm personally happy with, not just the dancers that come in. Very good. Um, let's jump into the first image, shall we? Sure. Just move on. So tell, uh, tell us about this. I, I will give you the heads up, guys. What I've done is, because the images are so amazing, I've actually shown the whole image. Then we'll kind of do a cropped image. We'll go back to the whole image again, in case you're wondering why we're going through it and things already. Yeah. Uh, uh, Francis, Cisco did say it was okay for you to do that. In the yeah, absolutely. I want you to see the quality of the dance move as well as the lighting and so on with it. Yeah. Take it away. Tell us about this yeah. image. So this, this image was done in 2016. Um, it's from a series called Shadows and Dust, which was one of my uh, first big series that I did with all Colorado ballet dancers. This is a friend of mine. His name is Sean Omendum. He's been there, I think, almost 20 years now at Colorado Ballet. And um, obviously, he's a wonderful dancer. As you can see, this pose is amazing. He actually does this um, quite a number of times during our Nutcracker season. He's uh, one of the my preferred casts of Russian um, in the divertisements in act two of Nutcracker and he does this a lot. Um, so when I got him in the studio it was something that I really wanted to try with him. It was uh, also when I didn't have a studio so we, we actually did it in the Black Box Theater at Colorado Ballet. Um, it's a very deep studio um, so we ended up actually the background's quite far away from him and the, the lights are quite uh, forward and then we have an, like an overhead light uh, I think from camera left coming in and then fill light from camera right. And um, this was one of the shoots, the, the shots that we got with, with him. Uh, but we had, if you could have like a, a sort of a wide angle view of this, what it looked like in there, we had dancers on every side of him just waiting to do the next thing. So we, I think we called for this shoot, we called about, um, I'd say 12 to 15 dancers. And we just did an entire day of just cycling through um, different poses, but um, 
This was done, I believe, with a D800E. I shoot Nikon, uh, and I've since upgraded to mirrorless, but this was one of those shots that w without the, the new auto-focusing mechanism on the, on the new mirrorless cameras, especially for the Nikon line, this was one of those shots that I, I got right at the apex of the, the movement. So sort of training myself, not only as a dancer, but as a dance photographer with some of that older technology was really invaluable in capturing these images. Um, but also being able to use some of the newer equipment as well to the full, full full potential. But I think this was done in a few takes, maybe. Yeah. And that's real height of flight there, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> My yeah. gosh. Um, so if um, a young photographer comes along to you and goes, right, I'd really want, or a dancer, and says, really, I, I want to take some great photographs of my friends, or I want to become a dance photographer, what's your kind of um, first go go to? How do they start off from a, a a dancer's point of view and from a photographer's point of view as well can you talk about both of those things for me is that right sure yeah and we actually um counsel people a lot on this because especially being a photographer that doesn't have a dance background it can be an added challenge to get those relationships and cultivate that um so from a dancer's perspective it's obviously a little bit easier if you're if you're in it if you're in that world if you have connections already it's a lot easier to approach those dancers. You typically already have some level of trust um, with those dancers, which is huge, a huge part of uh, developing any type of community and relationships with your, with your models. And a, as dancers, myself as a dancer, um, there's always a little bit of reservation when you don't know the photographer you're working with because dance is such a niche, um, you know, dance photography is such a niche uh, art form that you really have to, understand both the person and the, and dance as a subject. It's kind of like you have two subjects that you're dealing with at the same time. And so people tend, tend to have a little bit more reservation uh, when it's not a dance dancer that's also a photographer. And so um, as a dancer, you can basically just call on your friends to start playing around. Um, I think if you don't have a lot of studio experience and that's what you're looking to get into, it's always wise to check out uh, YouTube University and and figure out what the basics are for for the technical aspects of things and play around with the posing aspects of things with uh, location shoots. And uh, that would be the best way to to start, in my opinion, if you're already a dancer that's playing with photography. That's how I started. Um, you know, be before I even got to the stage shots, I first and foremost got friends of mine to go out on location uh, in Barcelona and we just went around town. It was a great setting, great backdrop to have very lucky to have started there. And we just did photos on the beach, in parks, in an urban setting, and just figured out uh, how to do composition and uh, posing, et cetera. So as a dancer, it's a lot easier to get to that step one. And then just learning the technical aspects of things is, is sort of the major hurdle. As a photographer who wants to get into dance, it's a little bit more challenging. There, what we always try and advise and what I always recommend is getting a good understanding of dance as a subject matter. So as portrait photographers, you know, you have an understanding of posing for, for a person and you have the lighting aspect of things to, to add to that understanding. When you're talking about dance photography, like I mentioned before, you really have two subjects. You have the person and then you have dance. And it's important to sort of understand both of those things uh, as separate in entities because what may look really great to you, artistically pleasing to you, from a human perspective may not be exactly what a dancer is looking for. So first and foremost, researching dance, researching dance photography. If you have local companies in the area that you can go and, and watch to get familiar with the terms, looking things up on YouTube, following dance photography accounts that uh, you can um, you know, call collections from um, of poses that you like so that you can show that as a catalog to your, to your dancers. Uh, that's always a great place to start. If you're so inclined, I also recommend uh, photographers try out an adult ballet class just to get into it, just to feel what it's like firsthand to be dancing and understanding some of that terminology firsthand is helpful, but also in terms of cueing. So if your dancer needs help, sorry, there's a there's an engine going by. It's okay. <laughs> we can only hear it a bit and you're louder than they are, so it's fine. Okay, all right. Um, as long as your studio's yeah. not on fire, of course. Let's no, not. No, we're okay. <laughs> In case it's of fire, artery. get out of there. Yeah. It's a main artery, so we have a lot of that. <laughs> today. 
Um, but in terms of cueing, it's also really great to understand what the dancer is feeling yourself. So that way you can say, okay, you can try it this way or you can do something like that differently so that they understand uh, a little bit more. And that also builds trust. So if you've, if you've taken the time to understand their art form, you're gonna get a lot more receptive dancer um, when you're doing your shoot. But before you even get there, you have to get them into your studio or into a photo shoot. So the best thing that I like to recommend is contacting dancers, uh, whatever method you feel more comfortable with, whether it's social media, email, um, if, you know, if you have a, 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 a contact in common that can um, connect the both of you. And um, just be very clear about what you're trying to do. You know, if you're just starting out and you're wanting to build a portfolio, like say that you're starting out and you're building a new portfolio and you want to uh, have this be a collaboration, you know, you want them to have final approval of the poses, uh, you want them to be really comfortable with the whole process, that way they'll respect what you're doing and come back for more. If they're a younger dancer, it's always really important to include the the parents or guardians in that conversation from the very beginning. That way uh, everybody feels comfortable and are on the same page. Um, and then typically if you're very o an open book from the very beginning, people tend to be a little bit more responsive to working with you. At least that's my experience as a photographer, but it's also my experience as a dancer. I've been photographed a few times by dance photographers who don't have a dance background and they've been really open with me and you know collaborative and we've gotten some great images and I'd work with them again myself. So. And I think when you've got Google at your fingertips and images galore, as well as a Pinterest and so on, mm -hmm. you know, um, e even if you're a little bit kind of uh, uneducated in the world of dance, but you feel it, you, you almost want to shoot the emotion of dance, you shouldn't fear not being a dancer. I mean, just, you know, it's obviously easier when you shoot your passion, without a doubt, but don't fear it. You know, I always kind of use the analogy of when I was in school, walking across the dance floor to ask the girl to dance was the biggest fear that any boy had in my generation. It's a long time ago, Francis, Cisco, you won't know those times. <laughs> but what I learned, what's the worst she's going to say is no, I'll ask a yeah, mate right. in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's it. And don't get put off by somebody who says no to you. Kind of keep it going. The first dancer I ever photographed was a girl called Jill. And I was 16 and I shot her in an alley. And that is when I discovered top light. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, I like that. I don't know what I've done or how I've done it, but I like it. And that basically followed me through kind of a lot of my kind yeah. of dance photography, just in a very small dark alley from light just coming from above and things really. Yeah. But yeah, great. I yeah. absolutely love this image. Uh, mm -hmm. It's absolutely brilliant and things really. So very well done. Should we move on to the next image? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cool. Uh, I've got a question before we get going. Um, is it easy to make a living from being a dance photographer or should I just continue as a passionate photographer of dance? I think that's a really nice question. question. Yeah. Um, it, it can it can be. I don't I don't know if easy. I don't know if any any dance photography business is easy, but it is definitely doable. And there are you know, mechanisms and platforms that can help you in that um, in that transition, if that's what you're hoping to do. The easiest way to get into it is actually through volume photography. There are many, many dance studios, at least in the United States, um, that do what's called recital pho recital photography. So think of, you know, your your school photography, your, you know, you get your yearly photo, except you do it twice a year with dance photographers typically, or dance studios typically, because you have a winter production and a spring production. And that's typically the easiest way to get into it because those dancers aren't necessarily looking for the highest quality creative shoot, something like what we're currently showing on the screen. It's more of a, 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 mi a mixture between uh, a journalistic style and just a little bit of creativity. Uh, so the posing is a little bit more simple. You're typically gonna get younger dancers where you can sort of have three or four poses that you know that they can do based on their age and, and skill level. And then you just pull from that and you just cycle them through. And then as they get older, you can change that up. They have a little bit more autonomy to pick their poses, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the easiest way to get into it, to, to build that uh, portfolio with reputation and also um, generate revenue. Uh, and there's a few different uh, photography platforms that are designed for volume shooting that um, work well for dance and, um, 
that would be my my first step that I would recommend is exploring that avenue because it's it's a little less risk um, and you can have the revenue that you would need to get started, which is how how I started. And then from there, you sort of grow into diversifying different types of offerings. You know, you can research how to do audition photos. You can research how to do more creative things and get a little bit more um, sophisticated with posing and lighting, et cetera, in your studio on, one, on a one-on-one -on -one basis rather than a volume shoot. Yeah. I mean, dancers still need head headshots as well, isn't it? Absolutely, you know, yeah. It's not all about body image uh, and body shape and everything else. That's got to be in their portfolio. But they're, they're like an actor and a singer. They, they need to show their versatility, but they also need to show their basic who they are mm -hmm. uh, to actually come across and things really. So we shouldn't forget about the headshot, a little bit of yeah. element on the side as well. Okay, let's talk about this image because ev ev everybody's telling me to shut up and get on with the, the, powder, the powder image. Yeah, um, this again was done, in, we, so with the shadows and dust shoot in 2016, which was the previous image, was done in conjunction with this. I believe this was day two. And in day two, we did the powdered version of everything. Uh, and this is a principal dancer, former principal dancer with Colorado Ballet. Her name is Maria Messina. She's a wonderful dancer. Uh, and she came in with so many creative ideas on that day. Um, I think her catchphrase for that day was more extreme, more extreme. And she really, she, she really has a huge personality and led the conversation. Um, the powder is flower. So um, the lighting, as I mentioned before, is kind of the same as the previous image, you know, the, the the gray background is about maybe 20 feet away from the subject and there's one key light from camera right this time and then there's a fill from uh, camera left. And the powder is flower. Um, I don't recommend doing this unless you have like hermetically sealed environment, which I found out the, the hard way. So we did this again in that black box theater and I, I don't think anybody with a gluten allergy could be in that studio for the next two weeks. <laughs> so there was a lot of cleanup, um, but obviously we, we were able to create some really great images. Um, I believe her arms are crossed in this because she had powder in her hands that she released as she did it. Uh, I also believe that she, um, she put uh, sort of the flower into her hair, went over, and she flipped back as as she jumped so that we would get those trails in her hair as well. So it, this one took a, a few different tries because we were trying to get the powder as well as the pose. Uh, and once we got that that pose and the powder going, we, we got a few different images, but this was by far my favorite. Um, I believe the little trail going down to the floor is from uh, some of the powder that I believe she actually had like on her shoulders so that as she jumped, it started to fall. And then that's what created that little trail, that sort of ghosting trail down to that floor. Uh, we obviously left the powder on the floor. We thought it was you know, authentic to do that and not, instead of trying to edit that out. Um, but this was a lot of fun. Um, I believe I had a headache for you know, about a day or two. I think I called in sick from work the, the day after that because I just couldn't get out of bed because of the, the flour and the powder. This was before we had an understanding of how masks could protect you from these types of things, and it wasn't so <laughs> ubiquitous. So uh, we kind of were just left to the elements, no ventilation, and uh, planning was poor, but the results were nice. <laughs> or shooting on location. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. Shooting on the beach is a lot in, easier. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, questions, uh, first of all. Um, uh, are you still using flour, or do you use an alternative now? Um, we haven't done any other uh, powder shoots since this one, but I think we would probably uh, change the the powder. Uh, I know that there's a few different ones out there. You have a colored powder, uh, things that are specifically designed for this type of photography. So we'd probably switch. So if we were to do it again, we'd do it with a different type of substance. Given an option to shoot the shot, would you choose a black male, a black figured male, a white male, a white figured male? The the list goes on. Who is your dancer type that you want? No, no, no. This is who I'm going for. I think that's what they mean. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we don't we don't pre-select people in that way. Uh, I mean, most of the clients that come in come in because they want to work with us. Uh, so they pre-select themselves. So it's kind of whoever comes through the door. Um, for our like more creative um, 
photos that we have jurisdiction over. We try, if we can, we try and have like a wide variety of uh, a diverse uh, pool of people that we pull from. Our main criteria is that they're a good dancer, that they have, you know, the facility, the lines, the the artistry, um, and the desire to work uh, to, to work with us. So whether that is male or female or, or of different races, that's really um, that's really not necessarily a factor. The primary factor is the the skill of the dancer and the willingness to work. The side question come in. Um... If you uh, do, you have visiting groups um, come in uh, to dance, and if so, do they kind of come in for a shoot anyway while they're in town? That's not the yes. exact question, but I've paraphrased it. Yeah, yeah. So we, well, we have we have different satellites, academies, and and companies that will come in to do their marketing shoots, but they're more local, locally based. Um, we have had a few. Um, performers uh, from Cirque du Soleil or Broadway shows that have cycled through that have come come through our doors and asked to do um, to do shoots with us and collaborations. Uh, but typically they're so busy that if they're touring to Denver, there's not a lot of time to set those things up. So we haven't had a lot of opportunity to do that, but um, we've had a few uh, dancers come through that are based somewhere else, but are from Denver, Colorado. So when they're on their off season, they'll come in and they'll, and we'll work with them. Okay, we'll move on to the next image, but I've got a question anyway uh, through. Um, it's about um, model releases and insurance. Um, mm -hmm. Because of movement so prolific in your photography, do you have to have a specific insurance? So we have um, sort of the, the basic general liability insurance, and um, I can't remember the exact policy limits, but it's 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 through a, a, an insurance company here in the states called Hiscox Insurance, and it's it's specifically for photographers, so covers any liability from any of our shoots. Um, it includes medical as well, so if there's anything that happens during our shoots that requires medical attention, that's already covered in there. Um, that also includes equipment um, and and that sort of thing. So uh, from that perspective, we we're covered on that end. From the 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 waiver liability from the from the models, um, we just have them typically sign a, a general release. Uh, it releases, typically releases us from, um, you know, any liability if they were to get injured, and then also um, allows us to use their images for promotional marketing and sales sales purposes. But um, it's always good to have both because a waiver is a waiver, but it's it's not a guarantee of anything. So it's always good to. Um, first and foremost, operate safely uh, so that your dancers don't or your subjects don't get injured um, or have any harm come on them and then also be protected in those two ways. Okay, cool. Um, Trevor just said, uh, wow, this looks like a, dad, dan, a dandelion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take um, it away. So it's yeah. a, another image of the uh, powder shoot? Yeah, another image from uh, powder shoot, shadows and dust. Uh, she's also a former principal dancer with Colorado Ballet. Her name is Chandra Kuykendall, a um, good friend of ours. And um, this image was great. Uh, it, it was it was a little tricky to to get the right angle for this, for her to look the way she does, sort of in that uh, almost question mark shape. Because for, I mean, for anyone, but especially even a dancer to try this, it requires a lot of bending um, and cueing this image uh, this time actually gave me a roadmap to recreate that with dancers here um, in the studio uh, in future years. So um, it's really hard for the dancers to go over their shoes like that, uh, their point shoes, because typically when, you're it, when your knees are bent in dance, you actually want to do the opposite. So instead of going over your feet, you actually want to pull back this way so you don't strain that arch. So this was almost uh, something that was counterintuitive to do because you had to sort of go into that uh, extreme, um, you know, stretched position and then also do a lot of other movement. So uh, this was, I believe she started, um, there's a few ways to get into this. I, she started on point and then sort of bent into it like an accordion. Uh, and then she also put one foot up and then picked the other one up to get on top and then bent into an accordion. But she had, again, sort of like the earlier image with Maria, she had, you know, the, the flower in her hair, it was over her, and then she she hugged this way. We played around with which hand looked better in the camera, and then she went into it that way as she went up onto her point shoes. Yeah. Um, question, uh, do you uh, have any in, um, 
influencers in photography who would kind of inspire you for shoot ideas or people that you followed in the beginning perhaps yeah there's a lot um you know on instagram there's there's a lot of different accounts um you know there's i i love rachel neville's work there was a former former photographer i, I believe i just found out she's um no longer shooting but um she's i believe her name is taylor uh, morris in, in australia she's no longer shooting but she has some great work um Nissian Hughes, he's based out of New York in France. There's some of um, the people that I, I've looked up to. Rachel Neville, I actually looked up to a lot in the beginning of my my career. I sort of loved loved her style, loved her lighting. Um, and um, yeah, I believe those are like the three main ones I feel. Uh, and then recently there, there's been a few um, other ones that I've really loved. And I've actually been able to, had the pleasure of meeting them in person. Um, Stephen van der Velden is one of them. Uh, I just met him in Chicago at a photography conference that we were together at presenting, and uh, uh, he's been a really great uh, person to follow as well. Okay, great. Um, let's go to the next image, shall we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. So this is a, a friend of mine. Her name is Fernanda Oliveira. She's a dancer with the uh, Philadelphia Ballet now, but she was formerly with Colorado Ballet. And this was one of the first shoots, I believe it was like the second shoot that we did in our new studio space here in 2020. Um, we were working a lot together in the studio, just doing maintenance ballet classes together, you know, with our masks, we were at separate bars and we're trying to stay in shape. And um, one of the things that we thought would be cool to do was one of these um, body paint, metallic body painting shoots that I'd done um, in 2018 as one of those larger series with Colorado Ballet Dancers. And um, what I realized working with large groups is that I was just exhausted at the end of that day. You know, they were long, like eight to 10 hour days. And uh, it was a lot mentally to try and come up with poses and make sure you're managing people. And I didn't work with anyone then. So it was my wife helping out myself and maybe a friend that was helping manage people and figure out making sure that people weren't waiting for too long on the side, et cetera. So I was like, let's try this again, but just with one person, take our time, do it over like two, three hours, uh, and just really dedicate it to, to working with one, one, one individual on one subject. And uh, obviously during the pandemic, it was even almost impossible to have more than one person in at the studio at once. So um, the fact that Fernanda and I were already sharing spaces on a weekly basis made it easier for us to be safer in that way. Um, and we were in our own bubble, so to speak. So um, this was the result of that. Um, the way that we carry on with these shoots is, takes about 45 minutes to paint the dancer. Um, we use a brush, we use a brand of metallic paint, metallic uh, powder that's called uh, Maron. Um, there's a liquid that you you buy with it and you just basically mix that. It's like, look, the containers are about this small, but you can paint a, a quite a number of dancers with just that amount. Uh, and we just use a regular paintbrush to paint them. Uh, they actually use, um, they're, they're in their underwear and they have uh, coverings for their tops typically. And what we do in post is uh, frequency separation to edit out um, those um, those garments and keep the texture of the the image. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's there's probably some questions about this, but um, yeah, I'll, can you I'll, talk yeah, can you talk through the lighting? Yeah, I was just about to I was just yeah. about to touch on the lighting. So there's a lot of top lighting from from this image. I believe it might actually only be top lighting. I believe we have a uh, a four foot by one foot strip pro photo softbox with a grid on top. And it's actually feathered so that the light, the back of that softbox hits the like the mid to front of of her, of Fernanda. Um, we did this for two reasons. Um, it limits the amount of hotspot that we we would get directly on her. So we have a little, we still have that contrast, but we have less of sort of like an, an uh, a blown out highlight. And then it also helps us control the the background so that it um, it sort of falls off into black as well, despite this being a great background. So I believe this is just one light. Uh, we're just working with one light. It's directly overhead pointing down. If anything, it's pointing a little bit towards the camera. That way we get a little bit more separation uh, between the background and her. And again, she's 
I'm trying to remember where she was in the studio here. She's probably about maybe 10, 15 feet away from the from the background. Do you meet them manually or do you do a series of exposures on tethered or how do you work? Yeah, we shoot tethered. Um, we're not as technical as some other photographers. We we do have, a, we, we, we do meter, we have a meter, but we don't, we seldomly use it. And we've gotten so used to understanding the lighting settings in our in our studio that we we kind of know we kind of know what to go for for each look. We know our settings. We know the lights that we want. Uh, that's not to say we don't experiment, but um, experimentation is the way we get our settings mostly. Do you have a preferred uh, lens? Are you shoot in fixed prime or a um, zoom lens, or what do you shoot with? Yeah, we use we use a zoom lens. Uh, we just transitioned over to to mirrorless uh, for Nikon, and we use um one of the kit lenses that came with it which is the 24 to 120 f4 uh, mirrorless lens um we typically shoot it around 75 and above before that we were with the 70 to 200 f 2.8 with the sort of the same same parameters there uh we we like the um the compression that comes from a little bit wider focal length it also helps uh deeper focal length and it also helps with uh distortion what we found even at 50 millimeters um and and lower is we start getting a little bit of distortion in in the dancer's proportions and um if we if we're not doing that for a creative reason we typically like to to keep it a little bit more um zoomed in okay uh preferred working aperture as a rule of thumb do you use anything specific uh, yeah f4 to f typically 5.6 is is typically where we where we land um we we sometimes go a little lower or a little higher, just depending on the lighting situations in our studio so that we don't get unwanted light in. Um, but that's that's plenty for what we need to do. Um, and we're okay with a little bit of ambient light coming in um, from our windows. It's it's all daylight. Uh, so we just, we just balance for that. And last of all, shutter speed. Are you uh, able to concentrate on freezing through a very fast shutter speed or do you pretty much freeze at the moment that the subject is still as it were yeah so for um most of our studio dance photography we don't really worry too much about the shutter speed we're typically just below our sync speed for our camera which is i believe one two hundredth of a second for uh for most nikon cameras uh it's always less than they they actually advertise so um we don't we can shoot in high speed sync but we don't because it it gives us less flexibility with the amount of power that we use in our strobes we work with pro photo strobes um, and so putting them into their freeze motion which basically gives you less consistent white balance but it's still perfectly usable um, by using switching them to freeze mode and then there's a new um, mode on some of the newer triggers for nikon pro photo uh, i don't I, I don't remember exactly what the transmission mode is but it basically cancels out all communication between the camera and the strobes except for the trigger Yep. And by doing that, you're actually able to shoot up to 20 frames per second um, in full frame raw, and the pro photos recycle that quickly. And because they're on that freeze mode, uh, depending on the power that you have them at, they the the recycling time um, is actually faster than any shutter speed that you not, not the recycling time, sorry, the flash duration time is actually shorter yep. than any shutter speed that I would be able to get. So my shutter speed is actually that. It's the T time that's determined by um, the manufacturer, depending on the, the shutter speed, it can be up to one sixty-three thousandth of a second with the pro photos. So, you know, if taking into account that most cameras max out at one eight thousandth of a second, you're pretty much left to the, sh the shutter speed is left up to how quickly and uh, it can turn on and off to capture that motion. Cool. Personal question for me: Do you like move movement in the image, or do you like a uh, an absolutely sharp image? It depends on the type of shoot we're doing. So uh, if we're doing an audition photo where it needs to be just very like flat lighting, um, they need to be in that position, very crisp, very clean. We'll go for something that needs to be a little bit more static. Um, we like to find motion, not necessarily with motion blur, but more with the types of poses we do, how we get limbs to cross to create that semblance of motion. Um, are they crossed? Are, is their body in a, you know, is a line of their body creating a circle that is gonna, you know, transmit that motion back? Um, we use fabric with, when we're doing our creative shoots. We have done rear curtain sync images where we, uh, you know, have a modeling light or a flashlight to sort of light paint 
uh, and then have a rear curtain pop a flash so that there is a light trail uh, in more creative images. But we typically try and do um, try and capture motion through posing and uh, different added elements such as the flower, such as uh, fabric and the pose itself. Cool. Um, let's go back to this image. One more question on this one before we move to the next. Um, as far as the pose is concerned, how, mm -hmm. how long would you have to get this image? So this is a little trickier. So in order to get um, this image, because she's over her foot, which is not a comfortable position to be in, uh, I believe she was over her over her back foot, her right foot, and the other one was actually planted on the floor. And she went into the position at that plank and then just kicked up and came back down so that there wasn't a lot of uh, force exerted onto that onto that right foot. So very, very short. Beautiful image. Well done. Nice thing. OK, before we get into the image composition, uh, there was loads of questions beforehand about can you talk about how much space you allow around an image when you're shooting? Mm -hmm. so how uh, much crop, in other words, I suppose? Yeah, sure. So for, for us, especially because we're doing a lot of full length work, the most important thing is for us to capture the pose. So in studio, we're working with a 12 foot background um, and you're not going to be able to see that here because we we kind of play around with the backgrounds in post, extending them, uh, cropping them based on the composition after the fact. So our priority, even if the limb is off of the background, our priority is to get the position. Um, so. If we can get them on the background, that's great. You know, leaving uh, sort of like what we have here, which looks like, you know, maybe a foot and a half to two feet on either side um, of realistic uh, dimension there. Uh, and then the top actually is completely, you know, recreated in Photoshop because in this, in our studio, we actually have um, 12 foot ceilings, which are, which are good. Um, and then we have some, some lighting that comes down um, that cuts in sort of around where just above her head is. So we actually edit all that out. Uh, and obviously the background is also extended because we don't have it coming all the way to the camera. So we we edit all that out as well. And the background's mostly done in post. Uh, so we have a little bit more flexibility with composition. Okay. There was a question before, which was about liquify and puppet warp. Mm -hmm. um, so within Photoshop, those of you who are not familiar with puppet warp, it's a mesh that goes over the image and you can basically select parts of the the animation of the limb to actually change what's your thoughts is it something that you do um especially with a a kind of a, a, a less experienced dancer or where you've pushed it a, a bit too much perhaps or something is it lick in other words break it down lickification is it used much by yourself and then is puppet warp a thing that you're kind of using at all yeah we've used both um, and we do use liquify more than puppet warp. Um, it is a, it's a fine line because it's also an ethical line that you have to draw uh, as you're working, especially with younger dancers, because, um, you know, in terms of body image, you want to be careful about what you're, what you're putting out there. Um, you don't want to, you know, do too much. And then I have that dancer have uh, a negative impression of, of, of their work that they've done with you. Um, at the same time, if, if you know liquefying is if you have two images right and you have one where the dancer has you know just the toes a little bit more pointed but you like everything else on that other image instead of having to like copy and paste from one and like try and do uh you know some sort of mask editing um to bring that limb into the other image or spending you know 20 30 extra minutes trying to get that pose exactly right um you know that to me is worth like you know push like using liquify to just help out those toes to match that other image uh, so that you have a little bit easier time in post and during the shoot so you don't feel like you have as much of responsibility to spend a lot of time, uh, tire out that dancer. So it's just a cost benefit analysis that you have to do, um, you know, taking those, those you know, ethics questions into account, um, making sure that you are um, also uh, creating a good working environment with the dancer and it's just a balance of all those things there's definitely been situations where we've played around to see what we can do uh, but those are typically not images that we would put out publicly cool um let's talk about this imagery um light, lighting first if that's okay yes um so this image has uh, one main light from from camera left and then we have a fill from um, camera right and then we actually have uh, I believe it's just one gelled image, one gelled uh, barn doored 
uh, stroke from the back. And that gel is a, um, looks like it's a red or a like a pink, pinkish toned uh, gel. And um, the the background actually was done with uh, with Lightroom masking. The that that AI has come a long way. And we knew we wanted to do something two-tone like this with a background. Uh, we just did it in post and added those gels to her to just sort of add a pop of color that would make it look a little bit more realistic. Um, so this background is actually gray. And then we have that little uh, pop of almost pink from the from camera left and a little bit of uh, purple from camera right uh, that's been done in, in Lightroom and post. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to have the option of having the gel, the gelled look, both in the background and on her, but also have the versatility to take that out if we wanted to have a version of this image where it was just the, the gray background um, with a little bit darker uh, contrast. Okay, uh, question that came in before. Um, do you sell your images uh, commercially as well as to the dancer client themselves? Mm -hmm. um, so if a dancer comes in and books a shoot with us, those images are theirs. So we include uh, delivery of a set number of images and what we charge up front. Uh, and then if they want additional images beyond what their package allows for, then we we sort of add that on on an a la carte basis. Um, these types of images here are things that we've done uh, creatively for this dancer. She's a soloist with Colorado Ballet. Her name's Jessica. And um, the leotard she's wearing is actually something that we got from a dance wear line that we delivered to them. So she came in um, to get some of these images and um, I, I believe we sent them to her. She gets them comp like for free, and I believe she also walked away with um, with a leotard as well. So um, we compensate in that way. Um, sometimes we actually do pay dancers to come in. For example, we're having right now we're creating a new fine art series that we have picked out certain dancers to come in for, and we are compensating them for their time. Um, and then those images will be sold to the public, but. Um, we do sell them to the public, even an image like this. Um, we have the rights to do that, but we don't necessarily have that right now. We're starting to go into that uh, with our new fine art series, and we'll, we'll sort of select some from our past images to also do that with. Have you thought about stock? Have you, re have you researched if there's any money with dance photography in stock, and especially with Adobe stock and free, free pick and the, the, you know, the yeah. thousand other kind of companies out there? Yeah, we've so definitely there thought any about money it. In it for you? I'm not sure. Uh, honestly, we've, we've, we've thought about it, but we haven't um, researched it very much. Uh, we're just because of time, honestly, but we, that's something that should, in our strategic plans, we've definitely started to look into uh, alongside with that fine art series. It's something that we want to see how we can create passive income from the work that we've already created. So that's, that's sort of on the docket as well. Sounds like you're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> fine art Sigmund series there you go i'm, I'm sure you will twist your arm i hope some days right uh the couple shot yeah omg to begin with okay uh -huh. this is actually my wife and a friend of ours a former principal dancer with colorado ballet um domenico luciano and my wife's name is tracy jones um she was a soloist with colorado ballet retired in 2020. um this was one of those large um shoots that we were talking about uh, it was done in 2018 um it's called Maron figures after the the brand of um, of metallic powder that we used. Uh, again, same thing, top light um, in the Colorado Ballet Studios. They were even further forward than we had in the studio, which is why the background has gone completely black. Um, and sort of same similar setup. We just created this image with and the series with the intent of showing off the musculature of the dancers. And the theme was to make them look like statues like Greek statues to show off their their bodies and their their physicality. And so a lot of the images, not this one in particular, but a lot of the images have them with their eyes closed to give it that more um, static look, more statuesque look. Beautiful. Could you talk about the lighting a little bit more specifically, uh, the exposure and control between the highlight and the definition in the shadow, if you could, just a touch? Yeah. Um, so I think this was actually a, um, a top light. We didn't have a strip box. So it was actually, I believe it was an octa box and it was, um, it had a grid on it. It, was, it wasn't it was too uh, 
too close to them. And the reason that we want it not to be too close to them is because if we do that, the fall off from, from the highlights to the shadows would have been quite drastic. And so by putting it up a little higher and those, those studio ceilings are, you know, 20 feet. So we're talking about a lot of range that we were able to work with. We're able to get a little bit more of an even exposure on, on them but because of that, because of the light spilling, the more that we get that distance from the ground, that's why we also had to bring them forward a little bit more away from the background so that we didn't have some a lot of that spill going on to the to the background and so really managing the the contrast between highlights and shadows depended on the placement of that light um, uh, in terms of relationship to the to the subject and the ground nice it reminds me um, of uh, Richard McDonald do you know the sculptor in Las Vegas uh, he he does a lot of uh, work with the Cirque du Soleil and basically dance as well. And yeah. uh, his sculpt, how I haven't been able to buy one, you've got to have a look just online. I, well, I've got the money to buy one. That's the first thing. <laughs> but every time I used to walk in, uh, we were chatting about WPPI before uh, we, we went live. And every time I was over there, <laughs> I'd have to actually go to uh, his, his 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 gallery. I absolutely love it. If you get a chance, uh, it's it's really worth it anyway, kind of thing with it. But um, I'm not sure if he's still there now. I haven't been there for years and things. But Richard McDonald, anyway. Richard McDonald. Uh, great. Um, the, the post the post production that you've done on it. Um, have you done much to actually make it almost feel like it's a sculpture, or is it just the paint? Yeah. So the paint comes a long way. And uh, we actually found that if you if you isolate the subjects, you can actually change the the t the color of the paint depending on um, you know how well you've masked it. So we've actually yeah. done a little bit of work with that as well. So you know increasing the 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 richness of the tones as well as adding a little bit of clarity filter. So but just isolating that clarity to the subjects because if you did it to the entire image, you'd get a little you'd it get it become a little flatter. You'd lose some of that depth. So uh, we've done an outline in Lightroom. So after we've done all the, the, the necessary editing with frequency separation, et cetera, uh, in Photoshop, brought it back into Lightroom and then just had sort of some presets for different types of paint, different color paints, and then just done some masking. Um, back in 2018, the AI wasn't as great, so it was more of a manual brush process um, and just adding some of those, those tones and, and, and the clarity filters to it. It's very nice. Love it. Love it, love it. Next image. Yeah. Uh, this was a test shoot for a Boulder Ballet campaign. Um, this is a friend of mine from uh, New York, so almost 18 years ago now. Not the image, the friend. <laughs> but um, his name is Michael Tucker. He is a dancer with Dresden um, in Germany. And uh, this was sort of the concept that we were coming up with for a Boulder Ballet, which is a local company here uh, near, near Denver. Uh, for their cam marketing campaign a few years ago. And um, he came in, he was visiting. I said, let's do this. I have this shoot that I need to do. Let's let's get in the studio. He was visiting us and uh, he was more than willing to oblige. The, the floor is actually the Marley floor that we have currently in our studio because our studio also doubles up as a, doubles up as a, as a private lesson studio um, for our students. We teach ballet out of here as well on one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so we use that Marley floor as the, the foundation for it. And then there's a white background. Um, the right part of that background is the white background. And then we brought in a mobile wall uh, just to give us the beginning of what that wall looks like. But it's actually very short. So the, the wall actually just goes up maybe a foot higher than his right hand. And then um, obviously the background sort of maxes out at around 12 feet. Um, and we basically just captured the pose. Um, you know, did what we needed to do to, to his position, his pose, um, figured all that out. And then we just recreate, we, you know, amplified, you know, content aware scaled, made sure the, the background looked like a wall rather than a paper back background and uh, extended the, the movable wall is actually on wheels. So we actually extended the wall down and we did a lot of, um, we did a lot of shadow editing on this one to make it look a little bit more realistic, but we're pretty happy with the way it looked out and the, the marketing images for the Boulder Ballet um, took it a step further than this, but this was one of the images that we really loved. Mm. Do you have a lot of companies looking at the likes of you now for 
their campaigns and things or do you find them still going off to advertising commercial photography where do they the big companies go for their photography yeah. nowadays so it's definitely something that we want to get into uh more so and we have a few companies that we've worked in the past with that uh we may work with in the future the pandemic really sort of pushed us towards um the individual client uh market more than the commercial side of things so we currently have a strategy to try and approach those companies again sort of restart those conversations pre-pandemic that were there um boulder valley was one of those companies and um it's really something that we would love to do more of um but again it's just those companies have relationships that you know have been in in place for many years a lot of them with dance photographers um and a lot of them like you said with advertising agencies but um it's just really hard for for people to get out of the habit of going back to the same person unless you give them a really great reason to do so so those are typically harder to to come by um but definitely looking into that now is that what the per uh, the personal projects you use in those four is that kind of yeah that kind of thing yeah exactly yeah so first and foremost it's because we love to capture those types of images um but it is building that portfolio for more of the commercial side of things um, to access those markets and eventually, you know, hopefully have that as part of the portfolio that we have every year. Very good. Love it, love it, love it. Well done, mate. Next image. Yeah. Uh, this is a former student of ours. She currently dances for Complexions Contemporary Dance in New York. Um, she's also like the homepage of our website. Her name's Lucy. Um, this image is really is one of my favorite images that we've done in the past few years. Um, my partner in the studio, his name is Colton. He started working with us um, about maybe two and a half, three years ago now. And um, he always loved really moody, contrasty lighting. And I'm the opposite. So this was out of my comfort zone. But we basically just used two strip boxes pointing forward on, on her. Um, and she was, she was home for a break. Uh, and we decided to have her in, do some creative things. Um, and those creative sessions are a really great way for us to expand our knowledge base, you know, try different lighting that we don't necessarily have the flexibility and opportunity to do so when we have a paid client, right? Because that paid client's coming in to and expecting a certain type of lighting because that's what we, you know, we advertise, you know, that's what's our yeah. portfolio. So these sessions are a really great way to work with really talented dancers, but also expand our range of, uh, of lighting techniques and styles. Um, and this was one of them. So this pose, she may have done before. It's just the lighting is what we changed, and that gives it a whole new life. So, um, do you studio stand, stroke tripod, or shoot handheld? Uh, we use mostly tripod, um, but we've recently started loving uh, getting really low, like close to the floor, to create like very compressed floor that then goes up into the dancer. Um, and we've even started leaving some of the Marley, because we have a Marley that leads into the background here, leaving some of that there to catch some of the reflection. Um, and actually from the conference that I just came back from in, in Chicago, it's a dance photography conference. And they actually had a high reflective white Marley on their white backgrounds. Yeah. And that was really great. It was an eye opener for me because I'd always use like plexiglass or tried to create it that way, the reflection, but the white Marley was actually um, a really great way to do that. So I, I was like, well, we have gray Marley in our studio. Let's see what that looks like. And it, and it worked similarly. Um, and it was a really great way to, to explore some of those things. Yeah. Good. Um, question, obviously, do you prefer, at what level do you prefer to shoot at for the majority of your work? Typically around like three feet off the floor or lower. There are some poses that we've um, learned over the year need to be a little higher, but typically lower is better for dancers just so that you create a little bit of a longer, they look a little longer as, as you're shooting from the down up rather than from the top down where you're gonna exaggerate, uh, as a general rule, exaggerate the top and then have their legs be a little bit shorter. So it's always typically a good idea when you're photographing dance to shoot from the down up. And then if we're you know at those uh, longer focal lengths as well, that gets a little bit less dramatic, but if you're really close, then it makes a big difference where you're at. Uh, recently shot with a dad, sir, not very experienced. I think they mean the photographer is not the dad, sir. Mm -hmm. But the but dancer didn't know when to stop. She kept on wanting to redo the shot. Any mm -hmm. advice for future shoots? That's tough. Um, my, I mean, my first question would be if, 
if you know if the if the photographer doesn't have a background in dance maybe the the dancer was maybe a little shy to say you know that's not really what we're going after and maybe making them feel a little bit more comfortable to to come out and just say like okay what do you want to fix about this pose do you want to move on and we won't use this one um because they were they were redoing it for a f number of reasons either they didn't like the the end result or they are perfectionists and sometimes we get dancers that even though like personally from me from my perspective it looks good uh, from a dance perspective it looks good they just may, may be the type of personality that doesn't like their pinky with a certain looking a certain way and that's hard to navigate whether you're an experienced dance photographer or not it's just a question of saying you know this is what we're going to get within the time that we have let's move on so that we can get some more uh, diverse images out of this session the time together and then if you want to we can go back to this image and if you know we don't end up doing that we don't have to use those images and then that way you're you're not completely shutting the door to them you're also not letting them go on forever and you have sort of a a roadmap to come back to it giving giving them that option often makes them a little bit more amenable to to move on uh do you have advice on the variety of images I should include in a portfolio dance? Uh, uh, a think, hard one, but go. Yeah, I think it just depends on what the purpose of the images are. So if you're doing a, just an audition photo shoot for a dance, a younger dancer who's, you know, maybe going away to a summer intensive or summer program, that's different than say uh, a professional dancer or a pre-professional dancer make, looking to make the transition to a company or change companies at which point you're going to want to have a little bit longer time with them. You're going to want to do different lightings, setups, maybe even do different backgrounds, different wardrobe, uh, and have sort of a category. The, the basic categories would be, you know, classical uh, poses, like very, um, you know, academic poses, or basically like technique, showing off your technique. And then maybe some more creative, maybe some more contemporary style poses that show off the versatility of the dancer. But falling into those two buckets would be my recommendations as a starting point. And within those two buckets, you can have different different uh, outfits, right? Or maybe different backgrounds or slightly different lighting uh, just to have a little bit of variety. But those would be the, the two main categories of, of poses that I would choose from. And then you can have a little bit more creativity within them. But just to give you an example, we if someone comes in for that type of shoot where they're more of a, a professional or pre-professional dancer hoping for a professional contract, we typically deliver anywhere between eight to 12 images. Um, they can all be in the same background or some of them are headshots. Um, so a good number is like eight to eight to 12 is really all you need. You really only need to submit as a dancer, like two to three. So if they have eight to 12 to choose from, that's more than enough. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I would try and find a local dancer that you use as a bit of a muse. I mm -hmm. think they can teach you as much as you'll probably need as well if they've been through photography over the years then they'll kind of know what they need they might even actually be able to step in for you at some stage and help you choreograph the shoot and to some extent yeah. you know the last thing you want is a dance instructor in there because they can be a nightmare especially if they're applying for a ballet school you'll know exactly what i'm on about francisco yeah uh they absolutely will be a nightmare with it okay um I i'm gonna term it in the american term uh i've got a series of dance moms that come in with a hundred outfits mm -hmm. what do i do to minimize what they bring <laughs> um, they, didn't, they didn't say dance moms on them but you know exactly what i'm on about <laughs> yeah um uh don't don't limit them on what they bring limit them limit yourself on how much time you have with them so be really upfront about you know you have 30 minutes you have an hour you have a three-hour session whatever you want to think about time-wise it's always a really great idea to, my, my philosophy is typically treat uh, treat your client treat others in general the way that they want to be treated so if you can do that without compromising any anything for yourself I think the like an, a really easy thing to do is just like you can bring whatever you want you know give them that flexibility give them the opportunity to do what what it is they're wanting to do but then you just make sure that you they have a they have a structure within to do that with so if you tell them bring everything and then you also don't give yourself a time limit, you know, or a set of a number of images that you're delivering to them, that's where the problem has. You have to have some sort of boundary 
that protects you while giving them exactly what they're looking for. And then they know like they can bring whatever they want, but if you don't have, you know, you say, if you know, we have this amount of time, feel free to change as many times as you want, but just make sure that you're keeping an eye on that time so that we can get as many poses as possible. And you tell them prioritize, you know, what you really want shot in and what you'd be okay with not getting images in. So. What would you recommend that every dancer brings in with them as a pure minimum? Ooh, uh, that's hard. Depends on the shoot, but um, I'd say bring it, you know, four to five outfits. We may only get to three with the time that we have, but four to five outfits is, a, I think, a good, um, a good range. Anywhere between leotards to sportswear to, you know, maybe some streetwear to even some more formal stuff. Um, those would be sort of the main recommendations. Yeah, I, I'd also recommend that, you know, you keep to a, a, a good impact lighting because that alone will kind of make mm -hmm. a lot of things shine out when they can be quite nor normal as such. Brilliant. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so, so much. Um, I absolutely loved having you on for the night. I'm sorry it's only down to an hour. But okay. absolutely brilliant. Just a quick revision on those images uh, that we saw tonight, those eight images. Um, absolutely br brilliant. Thank, thank you. Ooh, missed over one. Um, if you haven't been there already, uh, go over to uh, Francisco's uh, website with it, where if I click on it, it should come live. Uh, you can link over to the um, Instagram account there as well and things really. As far as education wise, is it mainly workshops that you do or is there video yeah. content or what or what can they find? Yeah, we're we're currently revamping the the, the education portion of what we offer, but we have um, yeah, we do workshops both in person and online. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, candidly created YouTube channel where we upload videos as, as often as we can. Um, there's one about editing backgrounds, uh, that's really great. Um, and uh, we also do um, mentoring, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and we're about to launch um, a group mentoring format as well so that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll sign on online and do some image reviews, uh, talk about dance photography, et cetera, anything that you need to know about the business or the technical aspect or the posing aspect of things. So, yeah. Brilliant. Um, anything that you'd like to expand on before we finish? No, I think that's it. I, I'm, I'm an open book, so if you want to, you know, send me a message, send me an email, I'm happy to connect and uh, just widen the network of photographers out there. Thank you very much indeed. Round of applause from me. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody, for joining us live.